was so good of you to stop by again. Welcome back to the Gallery of Curiosities. I remain, as always, your humble host, Osgood. It's still Lovecraft month here at the Gallery, which means we have been enjoying some strange stories, which fall into that peculiar subgenre that lies somewhere between horror and science fiction, and is traditionally called the weird tale. When one thinks of weird fiction, what is likely to turn, like the distracted boyfriend in the popular photo meme, to the Lovecraft pastiche? And that does seem unfortunate. I mean, let's think about that. With all the things one could choose from in the realm of the weird and the unknown, we keep coming back to our favorite franchise, as it were. Why is that? One might be tempted to think that the Elder Gods were once the stars of some delightfully nostalgic television series, which remains permanently lodged in our collective memory. Like, Welcome Back Cthulhu. Or, Room 222 at Miskatonic U. Our story this evening stars a young protagonist who, like us, just can't help but to return to that familiar unknown time and time again, even though we know quite well that it would end very, very badly. It comes to us from author Sebastian Mantel, a Canadian-born fantasy and sci-fi fanatic with a penchant for the dark and twisted and occasionally silly. When not working on a novel or churning out short stories, he reads anything from swords and sorcery to military history. It will be read for us by Mr. Wolf Moon. One Last Date at the Pitside by Sebastian Mantle This place used to be cool. While I grew up, it was called the Wayside Cafe, a grungy little bar restaurant downtown, which served as my choice eatery and watering hole since before I'd been old enough to drink. Back in the day, they weren't sticklers about ID. Then, the tourists came. In all fairness, the Pitside Diner isn't a bad spot. Sure, the old, perpetually jammed jukebox is gone, taking with it some of the room's old dive atmosphere. And yeah, the wall of lewd drawings is a thing of the past, bleached out of existence along with the rest of the wayside's graffiti in favor of a sterile white and red paint job. There's even clean furniture now, which, while it doesn't creak under me, lacks the worn in comfort of the stained, torn cushions I'm used to. But the food's as good as always, and the view is still the same. Well, not exactly. I pick a window seat and ask for coffee. No beer for me today. Today, I've got a date. But I figure it won't hurt to eat something, so I order my usual. The double cheeseburger topped with a fried egg and a side of thick-cut french fries. My phone vibrates in my pocket while I sip my coffee and wait for my food. I ignore it. She'll get here when she gets here. I'm in no rush. Nothing's bringing my spirits down today. Dory the waitress lays my plate down in front of me a few minutes later. Picking at my fries, I glance out the window. Yeah, I think to myself, a lot's changed. A kid poses for a picture in front of the green metal barricade which surrounds the pit, clutching a bundle of balloons that rustle in a gentle breeze. Nearby, a kiosk sells hats and t-shirts in its perpetual spot. The thin, bespectacled owner 
goes about his daily routine, flailing his arms at passers-by, hawking out two-for-one sales and coupon deals for aerial tours. He's got some new stuffed animals hanging from his racks now. One of them looks like a teddy bear with tentacles instead of arms. People buy weird shit when they visit here. That can't be helped. After all, we're a town that's made weird shit our defining attraction. A cop leads a family of four away from the barricade with a gesture to the yellow line painted on the pavement. In the age-old fashion of people finding themselves on the precipice of a high fall, they were leaning over the rail for a better look. Two men drift along the street handing out pamphlets, both of their faces hidden in the deep hoods of their brown robes. It's early in the day for them to be out. I sometimes speculate about how many people who take the pamphlets are actually interested in our town's local cult and how many of them just take the literature home as funny mementos. I watch a man accept the pamphlet with a polite smile, only to crumple it up once he walks past the monks, tossing it atop an already precarious pile of discarded drink cups jutting from the top of a garbage can. He must live here. Before I know it, I've chowed down on almost all my fries. I lift the top bun from the burger and place the last of the crispy golden bastards on top of the egg. My first bite comes with a pleasant crunch, followed by the gooey burst of egg yolk before my teeth tear into the thick beef patty and melted cheese. One bite's all it takes to get me going. Five minutes later, I'm wiping grease and salt from my hands with a napkin. I nod over to Dory. Apple pie, she says while taking my empty plate. You bet. A lot has changed about this old place, but two things haven't. Dory and her pies. Soon enough, I've got the steaming slice in front of me. A dollop of vanilla ice cream melts on its crust, topped with a sprinkle of cinnamon sugar. I'm just about to dig in when a voice talks down to me. I tried calling you. Her tone's about as pleasant as a cat fighting a buzzsaw. I look up. Julia's glare flickers from me to the pie and back. How many slices of that have you had, she demands. I shrug. This is my first. And I guess you had one of those disgusting burgers already, didn't you? She sits down across from me with her increasingly customary frown. I thought we agreed about your diet. I let my fork clatter to the plate. It was just a burger. Jeez, just let me live a life for once. I take a deep breath and close my eyes. No, I won't get into this with her. Not today. Look, I'm sorry I didn't answer. I figured you just wanted to give me the heads up that you'd be late. Actually, I was calling to ask if we could go somewhere else for lunch, but I guess it's too late since you went and ate without me. You can go ahead and order something. I wiggle a menu at her. Heard they do salad now. Julia scoffs. No thanks. I've seen what passes for salad in places like this. I've lost my appetite anyway. Hmm? I articulate around a mouthful of pie. Jeffrey, why do you keep bringing us here? You know how much this place freaks me out. Oh, enough. I've been coming here since I was a kid. I'm not going to be chased away by some tourist. At least not so long as Dory keeps up the good work. Isn't that right, Dory? Why, thank you, Jeff. The plump server comes over with her coffee pot and a clean mug. Get you started with some coffee, honey? Julia shakes her head. Tea. Chamomile, please. I can practically feel Dory trying not to roll her eyes as she trundles off to fetch Julia's tea. The old bag is taken to these changes worse than I am. Julia leans in toward me. You freaking know it's not tourists giving me the creeps, she hisses. It's not even the terrible food. Would you stop eating for two seconds and listen to me? 
The ice cream will melt. You know what I saw on my way here? A woman with her eyes rolled back in her skull. She just stood there, shaking, spilling her drink all over herself. She was foaming at the mouth, Jeff. Yeah, that happens. I wave it off. They usually snap out of it. Julia groans, gripping her bangs, burying her head in her hands. God, she lifts her head up. Jeffrey, you know I care about you, right? You know that's why I get on your case about your weight and about this place. I just want you to stop brushing aside everything I say. It's like you're in your own little world, and coming here all the time isn't helping you break out. She reaches for me, and I reluctantly put the fork down to take her hand. I use my other hand to wash down my pie with some coffee. Coffee and pie is by all means the single greatest combination ever thought up by mankind, in my humble opinion. Julia sure is pretty, though. She's a type of girl a guy like me's never supposed to get. Like there are rules in the universe in place to ensure slobs like me never land this kind of stunner. I can't miss the weird looks her friends give me when they see us together, confused expressions underpinning every interaction when people find out we're a couple. I don't hold it against them. Even I wonder why Julia's with me. After all, she doesn't like anything about me. Well, none of that's going to matter soon. Yeah, I have a date today, but it's not with Julia. It's time. I've got to man up and deliver the news. And here I am, holding her hand. There's a new gym near my house doing trial memberships, she says. I was thinking we could go together, make a morning ritual out of it when you sleep over. It's time to finally get you waking up in the morning like an adult. My concentration drifts, my eyes sliding to the window. Shapes shift around above the pit, reaching up within the edges of the giant hole. A little boy brandishes his corn dog at a shadowy tendril, wriggling its way toward the barricade through the pit's red-tinted miasma. An old hobo with a bottle wrapped in brown paper stands yelling at the vague shape of something which looks like a gigantic anglerfish with an impossible number of eyes. By the kiosk, a group of Japanese college students stand snapping pictures of their ice cream cones. Police and security guards walk around, making sure everyone stays safely on this side of the barrier, and that no one tries to feed any of the shadowy forms. My eyes rove past the steady activity of this sunny summer day until I see her. She's out by the barricade, waving to me with that big smile of hers. Are you listening to me? What? Yeah. I wrench my eyes back to Julia. One thing at a time, Jeff. Sorry? Can you say that again? You have to quit with this obsession over that hole. It's not healthy. Uh-huh, yeah. I know. Sorry. Ah, uh, she thinks it's the pit I'm staring at. Bullet dodge there. Just hang on, babe, I pray, holding back the urge to wave back at my lover. First things first. Like I was saying, Julia rubs my hand with her thumb in a casually intimate gesture. I've cleared out a few drawers for you, and some closet space. She tucks a lock of hair behind her ear. It'll be good for you, spending more time uptown with me, away from here. We can take dance lessons. Go hiking. There's a really nice vegetarian restaurant a few blocks away from me. I think even you will like. Also, if you're interested, my dad says he might have an opening at his factory. Eyes go wide for a moment. A nightmare. She's describing a living nightmare. How can I have been this blind for three years? I've been deluding myself. 
My whole adult life spent walking the razor's edge between getting laid and being myself. Until I met Lola. She doesn't just accept who I am. She wouldn't have me any other way. Lola's a girl who doesn't look down on me for coming to this spot, which I've loved since I was a boy. She's even eager to meet me here. Lola, a girl with an appetite who doesn't need to count every calorie or cloister herself into a gym, but manages to have a rocking body all the same. Lola, who's all mine. If Julie is laying out the groundwork for a nightmare, Lola's throwing me a lifeline to the dream. She's still smiling at me while a shadow flickers above. A great gray-green leathery wing pokes out from the pit's red cloud. Joggers passing by barely give it a glance. Gawking is for tourists. I can hear the clicks of flashing cameras mingled with the excited sounds of pointing children. The wing doesn't stay outside for long, of course. It dissipates, breaking down the smoke which is sucked back into the cloud again. Inside the red mist, shapes dance. Things like spiders and squid and fish, only distorted and wrong. A winged shadow moves within the cloud, trailing long writhing tentacles behind it. Vaguely humanoid arms hang beneath massive jaws, each limb ending in a three-fingered, webbed hand. Lola follows my look to the creature, then turns back toward me with her mischievous grin. Oh, the hours we'll spend here. Maybe we can even start naming some of the pit things. Jeffrey! Julia slams her palm down on the table. I snap my attention back to her. I'm not the only one. Sometimes you don't notice conversations happening around you until they all suddenly and awkwardly stop. I rub the back of my neck and look around with what I hope is an apologetic grin. The other diners turn back to their respective meals and talks. This is my favorite place, I hiss across the table. Don't embarrass me. It's me who's embarrassed. Here I am talking to you about our future together, and you're staring off out the window. We don't have a future together. I mean, it's like you don't even care about... What did you say? She stops mid-rant, her hand slipping from mine. Jeffrey? We don't have a future together, Julia. I repeat. This isn't working out. I'm sorry. Here's your bill, big guy. Dory slips a piece of paper onto the table, oblivious to the moment she's crashing in on. Oh, and I'm sorry, miss, but it looks like we don't have chamomile. Will Orange Pico do? I don't want anything. Julia doesn't take her eyes off me. I dig out my wallet as Dory moves on to the next table acutely aware of Julia staring at me. This might be the longest she stayed quiet in a sitting since our relationship started. I rifle through the wallet's meager contents. Screw it. I dump all of my cash onto the table, coins and all. A penny rolls off to the floor. Its clatter all the louder in the bubble of silence our table seems encased in. The world continues on everywhere except here, where Julia sits frozen in disbelief. I wait, equally still, in anticipation of what's to come. Yeah, I'd say Dory and the other folks working here at the Pitside Diner deserve a tip for what they're about to endure. Julia screams after me, following at my heels as I open the jingling door and hustle out into the afternoon sunshine. Of all the places to do this, I just had to pick my favorite greasy spoon in my favorite part of town. People look over at the developing scene. One bastard even turns his phone camera our way. I don't care. Oh, you're a joke, Julia seeds. A fat, worthless, stupid joke. I don't know what I ever saw in you, you loser. Don't ignore me, you overgrown child. What is it? Did you find some whore on one of your dungeon crawler games? I bet she's a cow. Jeffrey, you turn around and look at me. You owe me. I really don't, I call over my shoulder as I walk across the street toward Lola. Bless her, she doesn't even look embarrassed. She just gives me that same encouraging smile, waving me over. What did I ever do 
to deserve someone so understanding. Dirty, broke, lazy, good for nothing. Then again, I guess I've got a low metric to compare to. The students laugh behind their hands. An old couple shakes their heads with identical disgusted frowns. Glass smashes against pavement. The hobo swung his bottle down and lunges for the barricade. Some nearby cops pile onto him, pull him away as he shakes a dirty fist at the anglerfish thing in the red cloud, spitting slurred obscenities. Blissfully, people turn their attention to this new spectacle. I rush toward Lola. No one's there to stop me when I plant my foot on the barricade and launch myself over the rail into the pit. Lola catches me in the fierce embrace of a long estranged lover. I hold her, feeling her limbs around me for the very first time, not watching each other from opposite sides of a railing, but clutching on to one another so tight, it's hard to tell where I begin and she ends. Her skin is slippery and cool to the touch, and I realize with a blush that she isn't wearing anything. Boy, this is moving fast. A third appendage wraps around my waist and pulls me in even tighter as I stare into her six black eyes. She flicks a pair of gray tongues over my face, trailing cold saliva along my neck and ears. I shiver with excitement as the sensation tingles through me, evoking a reaction between my legs. We're sinking together, the red mist deepening around us the further we get from the sun. From above, I hear Julia's muffled shrieks. The anger in her voice morphed to horror. Typical. Everything's always got to be about her. I kiss Lola and she nibbles at my lips. Her pointed teeth tear off a chunk of flesh, sending hot blood running over my chin and into my mouth. Before I have a chance to react to the pain, she's got her mouth over mine completely, sucking the blood as she chews. Her tongues tangle with mine, then slither down my throat, choking me. From the waist down, I'm being pulled into a larger mouth below, one which is both wet and warm. Forget sex. This is where it's at, I think, as I experience the sensation of having my entire body slowly sucked in. The mouth chewing on my face releases its hold. The bloody saliva I cough up floats as weightless globules along with my fresh spilled gore. Above me, what looks like dozens of Lolas float around. Their gray-skinned, hairless forms flap limply against each other like a macabre version of the kids' balloons earlier. Instead of legs, their bodies extend out from a massive form beneath. Lola's a bigger girl than she let on. Whatever. It's not like I haven't lied about my weight. I've even fudged dating profile pictures once or twice. Lola's gigantic teeth stab into me, punctuating pleasure with spikes of pain that travel up my body until wet darkness consumes my head at last. Julia's shrill voice above cuts out. I'm encased in blissful silence. Wow. Lola likes it kinky. And I like a girl with an appetite. <laughs> oh, I did like that one. I hope you did too. I believe that's all for Lovecraft Month. I suppose we should give the tentacle monsters a rest for the time being. Oh, at least until October. We will be back for our usual fair next month and have some new exhibits ready for the autumn. I do look forward to the pleasure of your company then, next time at the Gallery of Curiosities. Gallery of Curiosities is produced under a Creative Commons International 4.0 non-commercial attribution no derivatives license. Don't sell it, change it, or 
with the transcript. Our theme song is Ashes Ashes by Deus Ex Vapora Machina. This episode was produced in August of 2018. For full show notes, visit us on the web at gallerycurious.com. that sound? I'm going to have to call an exterminator. I believe we have rats in the wall.